tonight. We're bringing you a very different here and now. It's your questions, their answers. Joining us live in studio, it's Premier Dwight Ball and Finance Minister Kathy Bennett here to take your questions. I'm Peter Cowan. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. And over the next hour, we're giving you a chance to get your questions answered about Budget 2016. And if there's any doubt about how contentious this budget is, let's take a look outside of our studios. We've got a live shot here. There are some protesters outside. They had a chance to chat with the Premier and the Finance Minister on their way in, and they've got certainly have their very own message for this government. Now, we've already received more than 500 questions about this budget, but we'll also be taking some questions live from our in-studio audience and from you on social media. Now, neither the Premier nor Finance Minister know what the questions are in advance. There are a number of ways that you at home or on your mobile device can get in on the conversation tonight. We have a live chat on our website, cbc.ca slash nl. You can also uh, comment and watch behind the scenes as things unfold through our Facebook live event. And we're streaming on YouTube. And if that's not enough ways, you can also <laughs> get in on the action on Twitter. Just use the hashtag CBC Asks. So Premier Ball, uh, Minister Bennett, thank you so much for joining us. So let's get straight to our first question. And, you know, many people have complained that the deficit levy is unfair to people on a low income. So this question comes to us via Twitter. Steve P Pick asks, why is a levy tiered based on income? Why not a flat 1% tax with minimum income level starting at $35,000? Well, I'll <coughs> thanks, Carolyn, for the question, and thanks, Steve, for uh, for uh, chiming into this evening's event. When you when you <coughs> look at taxation in the in the in the province right now, what's I think the what we've considered when making the budget was that you looked at the complete taxation uh, bucket as as people pay the taxes. So if you look at if you look at the question about thirty five uh, thirty five thousand dollars, first of all, the levy is on taxable income. It's not on net income. It's on taxable income. So in the case of 1%, in this particular case, it would have been, uh, you know, whatever the taxable income reduced by the net income. <coughs> so at a 1% at that level would actually be even more uh, than you would see by the current levy that's in place right now. So these are some of the considerations. And, and for, as an example, an individual at $21,000 right now, if you look at this temporary levy, levy and this is a temporary levy, uh, the impact on that individual would be is $60. So a 1% at that level would indeed <coughs> be over $200. So these are some of the considerations that we made. As, and, you know, indeed, when you look at the complete tax package uh, at all income levels as well. But a lot of people are looking, especially at the higher income mm -hmm. people, saying mm -hmm. someone who's making $600,000 a year, if it's 1%, they're all of a sudden now ma paying $6,000 instead of just 950. So why not make those upper income people pay more of a levy yeah. as a percentage of their income than the lower income people? Are and paying? you know, when you look at the, uh, you know, Peter, you're right, because when you look at the, the tax structure <coughs> itself, is that people on the higher income levels are people that we de actually did tax much more to the point where there are three percentage points more on the higher income level. So uh, it's about the, the tax package itself. And we've put in place to offset and mitigate uh, some of the impacts of the taxation measures that we have in, have in the province, a $74.6 million dollar, uh, income supplement program. So that will help offset some of the costs and the tax of this tax measure. I don't know if the minister wants to add a few comments to that, but yeah. that's, uh, that's kind of where it is. Certainly, and the, the decision around the uh, changes to tax for individuals are made up of the personal income tax and uh, the deficit levy. And make no mistake about it, there is nobody in our government, the Premier and myself included, uh, that is happy about increasing personal income taxes, either through personal income tax or a levy. But when we come to the high income earners, I will say that we were very happy to increase those rates uh, to the highest they've been since 2001. They had dropped to the lowest they've ever been uh, under the Conservatives. And, you know, our responsibility um, in making sure that, you know, first and foremost, I understand, we understand that this budget is tough for a lot of people. And it's really tough uh, to understand the amount of change that has to happen. But our province is in a very, very, very difficult situation. And we have to be able to uh, get ourselves out of that over the next number of years. 
But why not listen to people? Because there's been so much criticism of this levy. Mm -hmm. It's been the thing that people have criticized more than anything else in a very big budget. Why not say, you know what? We're willing to listen. We're willing to go back. And maybe we'll come up with something that addresses the concerns that yeah. you've heard. And, well you, and the listening, you're, mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, the levy has certainly been something that uh, has drawn most of the attention that we see in this budget. It is a temporary mm -hmm. levy. We put in place mitigations to help offset those that are impacted by this. And when we, r when, it get when, it when we start rolling it out and taking it back, we will start at the lower income level. We've, we've announced that already, and as, and as soon as we're in a position uh, to able to do that, and I hope uh, that's sooner than later, Absolutely. that we will, we will start rolling that back also. But, but when why you not go to that issue of actually going back and reviewing it? Say, you know what, we're going to go back and look at it again. When you look at the, uh, the seven-year forecast that the minister mm -hmm. put in place, there is already measures put in there that actually takes that temporary levy out. So it's part of the seven-year uh, forecast that we have, and really right now the focus you know, with, with the budget right now, the next step for us is to make sure that we get as much waste mm -hmm. and efficiency inside of government, and this will enable us to actually get the things like this levy <coughs> back out and put more money into pockets of Newfoundlanders the and Labradorians. You know, the, the, the revenue um, decisions that we had to make as part of this budget um, are not ones, as I said earlier, that we're um, happy with. And they're ones that we want to change as quickly as we can. And we will change the temporary deficit levy and move it out and eliminate it as soon as we can. And we will mitigate it on the low-income um, earners. But that said, you know, we need to also understand that in this fiscal year, um, the revenue from the levy is going to raise about $64 million. And that's actually not enough to pay for the cancer care in the province. Now, I understand that people, and we understand that people um, don't like the levy, um, but the alternative to the levy uh, would be to, to do some type of cuts. And that wasn't something, um, you know, at this particular point um, that we thought um, made sense. And, and, you know, paying the temporary levy, which I know people in the province are not happy with. I understand that. The Premier understands that. Um, but we're in a very difficult situation. Our debt that we're carrying and the amount of money um, that our province is going to have in debt in the next five years is going to be the, the most we've seen in our history. We carry more debt than any other province. We have the highest uh, debt numbers per capita. And that's going to affect our ability to deliver services if we can't access money. I was, uh, I was sharing a story just uh, well, a few days ago about people would say that it took us a long time to get here. And therefore, you, know, you, do not, you can be a little slower in trying to solve this problem. It took us 66 years to get to just over $12 billion in net debt mm -hmm. in the province. In the next five years, and I'm sure a lot of people that are watching this tonight, a lot of people in this room, that would double. So in 66 years, 12 billion, just over 12 billion, in the next five years, based on the track that we were going, that would double. And we would see uh, interest, paying interest or debt servicing, it's surpassing education already. So when you see over the next five years where this was headed, uh, you know, the future in terms of debt servicing and borrowing was pretty bleak. All right, well, let's get to uh, another question from our mm. audience. And this one comes in on Twitter from Paul. And uh, he says, and I'll put this question to, to both of you. Oh, sorry, we don't have Paul. Uh, okay, here we go. There it is. All right. So this question, Melissa Bourgeois, why did you choose to implement full day kindergarten at the expense of the entire <laughs> education system? Mm -hmm. Well, full, <coughs> full day kindergarten was a, uh, was, is a $13 million uh, program uh, to put full day kindergarten in, in classrooms right now. We already know that most jurisdictions within the country would have full day kindergarten. So it was important for us to make sure that, uh, you know, our our children would be on a, a level playing field with uh, with other provinces. Also, uh, it was important to note that you know research would show that the uh, development of children uh, before the age of six is this is where the develop most of the development would occur with our young children. So this was an investment that we made uh, within for our children uh, to impl implement uh, full day kindergarten into the education system. But if there's a yeah. fixed number of dollars, if there's not a, a lot of money to go around in the education system. It's costing a lot to add full day kindergarten, but at the same time, you're having to do things like multi-grading, increasing class sizes. So it may help at, at that end, but 
isn't it going to hurt student achievement on the other end? Well, I'll just speak to the multi-grading or the combined oh grades God. because it's really two classrooms that would actually, two classes, so two grades, not multi-grading where you would get you know, three classrooms. It's two, it's two classes that would be in a combined uh, grade system. And y one thing is that that is also capped at 18 students in a combined grade, which is actually lower than the classroom cap uh, for uh, kindergarten right now. So these are some of the things that had to be considered, but adding full day kindergarten to the educational program was, ins it was important so we be able to have our children, you know, at the, uh, where you'd see in other provinces, and it was a $13 million investment into full day kindergarten. And many, and many parents and many people across Newfoundland and Labrador, as a matter of fact, all three parties had, uh, you know, had, had been promoting full day kindergarten. So it was an important, uh, an important decision for us to make, making sure that our, our children are on the same level playing as what you'd see in other jurisdictions. Well, and, and in addition to, um, you know, the differences between our province and other provinces, I mean, one, it, one important uh, thing to understand about full day kindergarten that, that we know is that children who are um, uh, in low income in, dis in, in situations where they uh, don't have the same opportunities to get a head start and get ready for that first day of school, um, they're at a distinct disadvantage when they enter, um, enter school. And you know, the, the idea behind uh, full day kindergarten is to give those kids an extra, um, an extra opportunity to be able to enter school and be able to achieve the things that they must, they must be able to achieve. Um, but you know, the choices in the, in the budget, without a doubt, have been difficult. And we're gonna have to you know, continue to work together as a community to see what are the other things we can do and what are the things that we need to have conversations about, um, particularly about making sure that we don't pay. Think about it that we don't pay more on debt expense than we do on educating the, the, our kids in the province, which is where we are right now. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I know the Premier, myself, the caucus, our government is not happy that we are in a situation where we're spending more on servicing the debt of our province than we are on educating our kids. Okay, so we're going to head into the audience now and uh, speak with someone uh, who has a question about long-term care in this province. Lorna Yard, do you mind standing up so everyone can see you? So uh, your question is about uh, the 40 long-term care beds that were closed at Masonic Park. And this is something that has affected your family. So what, what is your question? Um, would you like me to I can hold this for you, yeah. sure. Good evening, Premier Ball, Minister Bennett. My dad is a resident at Masonic Park, and uh, you can imagine that the announcement to close mm -hmm. came as a pretty big shock to us. Also fairly shocking was the fact that most, well, a, a good number of the Masonic Park community found out through the media. So initially that was a red flag for us to wonder how much thought went into this decision. And in the ensuing weeks, we've had a lot of misinformation and broken promises from Eastern Health on how they plan to roll this out. So that's meant their decision. Um, you know what, I'm working, I have a full-time job, I'm an average Joe, I'll take the levy, I'll take the tax hike, I know we're in hard shape and everybody knows that and I can do my share. But those people at Masonic, they're among the most fragile amongst mm -hmm. us. And I just need you to know right now that those people are terrified, they're upset, and their families are distressed. And I'm only here today to appeal to your humanity, and I'm not asking you to reverse your decision. All we're asking is if you could please put the pause button on this. Give us time to make sure that families are consulted and that we can take care of the dignity and the well-being of those people. Thank you. The, the provision of long-term care within the province, uh, I guess I should go back to when we, uh, part of the government renewal initiative, when we went uh, and met with Eastern Health, I didn't go there personally, but we had groups of people that met with Eastern Health, as they did with many other groups across the province. And one of the, the questions was, is where can you find, you know, the, the efficiencies within the system that you not Im impacting patient care? Uh, one of the things around long-term care was basically how we provide long-term care to the province. And if you remember back to a long-term long care uh, RFP that was put out last year, when that came in and we looked at that, that was very narrow in scope. So there's two aspects to it. About 40% of long-term care can be provided in the community, in people's homes. So we've invested in the uh, healthy in-home assessments now in this particular budget because we know people would prefer to stay home as long as they can. And 60% of those uh, long-term care requirements would be in some kind of uh, facility like we see, like we see in at Masonic Park. 
So the information that was given to us is that there would be uh, facilities or, or rooms available, units available, to provide the service to, uh, to those long-term care residents in another institution that would be, in fact, improvements over the current, uh, over the current, uh, the current living arrangements. So that was the information that was shared with us and how that decision was made. I uh, understand it's been very disruptive for, for you and your family, and we get that. And, you know, if it, if it, these are the things that we need to consider now. And the, how the information came to us was exactly through uh, the initiative that was done in discussions with Eastern Health. And, and I just add, I mean, one of the things about the budget and all of the, all of the decisions that were made, there's, uh, you know, every, every decision has a transition plan to it. And in your situation with your dad, um, it's really important that all of us, not just government officials, but those people working at Eastern Health, those people that are working at Masonic Park, those people in your family, that we're all working together to make sure that, you know, he doesn't feel the way that you're describing. Um, as a community, if, if, you know, if these are the changes that must be made, then as a community we all have to figure out a way to work together to make sure that, you know, he's supported in the transition and that your family's supported in the transition. So let's go to the next question, and this is one that came in through email, and it's to you, uh, Mr. Premier. As the minister responsible for Labrador and Aboriginal Affairs, how can you let the community of Black Tickle lose the only nurse they have? It's a remote community, it's fly-in only. I guess the concern is if somebody has a heart attack here, who's mm -hmm. going to be there to look after them until <coughs> that plane can get in and get them out? That's exactly. Well, we, uh, that again, was done with the consultations with uh, Labrador Grenfell in this particular case. And I've been in this community in the past, so I know the, I know the challenges that the people in Black Tickle would have to face. And so I will tell you that uh, the, the situation as it currently exists right now is the position has been, been vacant for, for, for some time and recruitment in, in Black Tickle has been very difficult, but we've made a commitment to be working with Labrador Grenfell in this particular case for the people of Black Tickle to make sure that we can put in place a delivery of health care you know, that people need. And uh, so we'll be meeting with Labrador Grenfell uh, to actually see you know, what arrangements can be made for the people in Black Tickle because you know, understand, uh, I understand how difficult it is in some extreme circumstances that we see in Black Tickle. But how can you provide health care if you don't have even one health care professional there on the ground in order well, to at least get them by? You know, making sure that we you know, have people that can be there and can provide, and can provide that uh, continuity of service that's required there. So these are, this, is, this is an example that we've got to get back to Labrador Grenfell and making sure that we put in place a sustainable health care delivery uh, for people in Black Tickle. And so why not do that before you announce the decision? Why not come out and say, you know, we're going to take this position away, but we've got a solution here? The, um, I, it is important for the people in Black Tickle also to be um, informed that this decision around the change uh, doesn't take place until October, okay. and our plan is to work, as the Premier has said, uh, with um, Labrador Grenfell and make sure that, again, as we mentioned earlier, the transition of how this happens um, and the ideas that the community has are, are taken into consideration and that you know, we, we provide the services that, that people need. But it's not happening tomorrow. It's scheduled to happen in October, and certainly we have lots of time um, to continue to work with, the, you know, very passionate MHAs in uh, Labrador who are representing their constituents to us uh, in uh, conversations on a daily ba basis in our caucus. Hey, you're watching a special edition of Here and Now. Your questions, their answers with our guests, Premier Dwight Ball and Finance Minister Kathy Bennett. And you can join in on the conversation, too, in a live chat on our website. You can also get your questions or comments to us through our Facebook page on YouTube and on Twitter. Just use the hashtag CBC asks. So we're going to go to Twitter now for our next question. And this comes from Andrea Newbury. Uh, she asks, Please explain to us why you chose to tax books so much instead of something else such as cigarettes, junk food, soda, etc. So why not put in some taxes on junk food rather than books? Well, first of all, uh, there is there is GST uh, on books. There's a 5% tax on books right now, which is the federal tax. So it going through uh, going through the the options that we had to pick from, you know, books was, was very difficult for us, but uh, for the taxation on books, there was already uh, taxes on, you know, e-books e, uh, e books that was already in place right now, so you would see the, the full tax regime on e-books. 
uh, the, we have, you know, institutions like university and post-secondary institutions, well, they will not be paying uh, the tax, the, the full 15% in tax. And it's one of those initiatives that, you know, at some point when the province is in a better uh, financial situation is in. It is, it is a tax that's there right now, and all of those uh, revenue options around taxation, all of those when we get in a better position, uh, these are things that you know, we need to be taking a look at. But uh, it was very difficult to find even a million dollars, I will tell you, within this budget envelope right now. Very difficult indeed. And these were some of the tough decisions that we had to make. To get from, we were last year, uh, anticipating when you look at the budget for this year, they were forecasting just under $900 million deficit this year. Well, you know, when we took, when we got in there and started looking at the financial numbers in our province, they were at $2.7 billion. So it was essentially in one year tripled the forecast on where we thought we were last year. And this is what made this process so difficult. And, you know, it's, it's decisions like that that, as uh, the minister said, were very difficult for all of us. But, you know, it's our job right now to actually put in place a strong financial foundation so that we can get the economy back on track and make sure that we can put in measures so that debt servicing does not become the biggest industry in our province. But if we tend to tax the things that are the worst for us, I'm thinking cigarettes, alcohol, mm -hmm. they have a lot of tax on them. What about that idea that that person raised there about taxing junk food? Mm -hmm. That way you're discouraging a bad behavior, you're going to see some dividends mm -hmm. on the healthcare system yep. rather than discouraging good behavior like mm -hmm. reading more books. Yeah, well there is, uh, there is, we did increase the tax as an example on, uh, on tobacco and we put in place to offset that uh, some smoking sensation pro uh, programs as well. Uh, there's always a fine line when you look at taxation around things like tobacco, how much of that will actually be forced to the underground economy as an example. And so mo there is research that shows that there is somewhat of a, a tipping point in all of this. So just the taxation on tobacco brought us in just over $5 million as an example, what was already done. So it's, uh, these are the decisions that you make with the information that you have, making sure that you can secure those sources of revenue. If it was up to me, I'd put, to, I'd put uh, that, if there was no tobacco sold in our province, I would feel much better because I think that would be better for the overall health of our province. But you know, right now we have a, a lot of smokers within the province and adding this extra tax, you know, keeping it where it needs to be in the economy, not driving it underground, was really how the decision was made. But did you look at putting a tax on other unhealthy things, things like sugary beverages, for example? That's something that we've seen a movement in Europe especially. Yep. Absolutely. And um, currently in Canada, no other province um, has that tax. Um, we analyzed the administrative costs associated with it. And as a province, we would have to take on the administrative responsibilities that would be equal to um, you know, functions at the uh, Canada Revenue Agency. So it was definitely something that we considered uh, for this uh, budget. And uh, based on the administrative costs and the um, additional um, things we would have done to collect it, um, it wasn't something that we felt that a province of half a million people uh, could take on that administrative cost. Um, you know, every, every decision we make when it comes to revenue, we also have to be able to um, provide um, mechanisms to be able to collect that tax. And when you create new costs, that creates a need to do something on the other side. And while it was certainly uh, something that our department looked at very closely, and other governments have looked at very closely. As a province of a half million dollar, uh, of half a million people, uh, taking on the administrative costs for a Canadian system, uh, you know, it was something that uh, we just didn't think was uh, something that we yeah. needed to focus on. Yeah, today. I think, and uh, the minister raises a good point because when you look at, it, as an example, many people in the province would think that the home eating rebate is discontinued, but the home eating rebate is actually brought into mm -hmm. uh, the Newfoundland and Labrador income supplement. By, but we've put that out there now for four times a year, and one of the reasons for doing this is that uh, we, had a, we had an office that actually uh, did the administration around home eating rebates. So we were able to actually get uh, over $2 million to put actually mm -hmm. into that program simply because we could take into uh, the, the federal government programs and actually putting checks out four times a year because they have the mechanisms in place. So what we see with our, our supplement program, it becomes in addition to the, the, administration, the administration that was already in place federally. So indeed it was a, a cost savings for the province, mm -hmm. but we were indeed able to put more money into the low-income earners and seniors in our province.
Well, that leads well into our next question, and this is one that's come on our CBC chat that we're doing at cbc.ca slash NL. And this is from Denise Peckford, who asks, a lot of government departments, corporations, boards appear to be top heavy. Mm -hmm. Why is it necessary to have so many levels of management? Why not decrease the number of managers? And she says, that's where you can save some big dollars. So why not decrease the amount of management? Ms. Bennett. Well, you know, when we look at, uh, when we go through the government renewal initiative and we look at the programs and services that we have to provide for the people of the province, one of the things that we have to look at is what does the workforce need to look like for that service? What does the management workforce need to look like and what does the uh, frontline worker workforce look, need to look like? And, you know, it's really important for us to make sure that we have the right people in the right place doing the right job to provide the service. Um, there is no doubt from the experience that I had uh, in my role as uh, president of the Treasury Board that when we had the agencies, boards, and commissions come into Treasury Board to talk to us, many for the first time they'd ever been into Treasury Board, about their operations, um, it became painfully obviously that obvious that as a government, as elected officials, we need to um, hold those agencies, boards, and commissions responsible and accountable for the public money that they are spending on our behalf as citizens of the province. And that would include everything from their operating costs to also their um, salary packages and how they relate to uh, core government uh, salaries on across all spectrums. And so if we look at the supplemental budget that's coming this fall, is that one of the areas that you're going to be looking to try and find efficiencies, as mm -hmm. you call them, this management area? Well, we'll certainly be looking to work with agencies, boards, and commissions through <coughs> the normal Treasury Board process to talk through how their um, benefits packages are uh, presented to their employees, how, um, you know, how they um, justify their operating costs. Um, but we have, to, we have to collectively get everybody who is spending government money, taxpayers' money, uh, to make sure that we're all sharpening our pencils a bit. And um, it was evident when we went through the discussions with the agencies, boards, and commissions that there's an opportunity uh, for us to do that, and uh, one that we need to make sure that we are taking the waste, taking the excess out of government, uh, spending in all areas. So when you look at the uh, the budget, you know, that the minister uh, spoke to on April the 14th, there was about, there was nearly $300 million, even in the first four months, mm -hmm. that we were able to find inside of government to actually create some of the efficiencies and so on. So that work continues, and you know, it's, uh, it's a big budget, it's $8.48 billion. There's about $3.8 billion in, in salaries and administration. Uh, some of that, you know, a lot, uh, much of that is in, in management. Some of that, or most of it, would be in the, uh, in the unionized workforce. So I think it's incumbent on, on any government to make sure that you, uh, you provide those services as efficiently as possible with the right amount of people that's required to deliver the services. And, you know, that's where we, that's where we, that will become our focus right now. Okay, well, let's head out into the audience. Carolyn Stokes has someone here with a question that he'd like to ask. Yes, thanks, Peter. I'm here with uh, Doug McCarthy. And uh, Doug, you're a, you're a cab driver. And I guess you feel uh, uh, unfairly targeted, especially targeted uh, by this budget. You've crunched some numbers. Uh, so what's your question to the <coughs> Premier and the Minister? Well, thank you very much, uh, Kat. Uh, Mr. Premier, Madam Minister, uh, the taxi industry unfortunately uh, is going through some rough times as is the province with the current budget announcements of the 16 and a half cent per liter tax that will cost my, just based on my numbers from myself alone will cost me twenty seven twenty five hundred and seventy five dollars the HST increase of two percent will cost an additional three hundred and thirty eight dollars as you are well aware, we're getting hit with another massive increase in our insurance premium this year of 30%. That's going to cost me another $941. Now we throw in the 15% HST, which will cost me another $611 on the insurance, and uh, 20 to 20 to another $20 on my licensing fee. Mm. So that will cost me $4,485 of lost income. Doug, would you mind explaining the uh, 941 number, the 30 percent that you're mentioning? Uh, as I understand it, uh, yes, we have an insurance increase approved by facility and the PUB for this province, which works out to approximately 30 percent. So that'll be the third third increase in four years. Okay. Now the uh, the 2,500 dollars that you mentioned in terms of the gas, 
uh, the gas tax, the 16 point cents that you mentioned. I think if uh, the numbers are what we're showing right now is that we were even with the 16.5 cents on compared to where we were and the cost of doing business within Newfoundland and Labrador last year, it's, it's really about the same. And the intention here, as the minister has mentioned in the budget speech, is that as the price of oil goes up, this, this tax will come back down. And you know, I'm hoping that, that tax will fall quite quickly, to be honest with you, yeah. because I wouldn't mind seeing the price of oil go, uh, go up a bit right now, because that would mean that there will be more royalties and we can get, and this 16.5 cent tax will come down. Well, based, just based on today's prices of $1.07 a liter, the taxi industry in St. John's alone will generate for the province $1,300,000 over one year. Our, my, our question to you then is, is it your intention to drive out of business the small operator, the marginal operator? Because if it is, this budget will do it. Yeah, absolutely not. And when I mentioned about the $2,500 that you mentioned, uh, for instance, in your cost uh, to purchase gasoline in the province, you know, the, the numbers that we compare things to now is actually gas is really right where it was 10 years ago. And when you compare us to where we, to last year, it would be even with the 16.5 cents on, we were right really in, in the ballpark. So, and as that, uh, as the price of oil goes up, you know, this, this tax will come down. That's the way it's designed and the minister has, has spoke to that, mm. you know, uh, on many times. So that's the, uh, so no, it's not our intentions. Our intentions right now is to, uh, do whatever we can to, you know, work with small business operators and small business owners in the province to make sure that we can put in place a solid foundation so that your business is, su is successful and indeed the province be can, be can uh, once again become su uh, successful in the future. The next question we have is one that came from Eugene Hart from Shehajit Inu First Nation. And he's the chief there. And what he wants to know is, as we are a reserve and much of our funding is fixed, why wasn't this matter discussed with the Shehajit Inu First Nation prior to the budget being handed down as a matter of courtesy and respect? So why didn't you reach out, especially as the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs? Yeah, I met with uh, Eugene and, and many of the people you know, in, uh, in Cheshire uh, just, uh, just a few months ago, actually. And the, the impacts that we've seen within the province as you prepare your budget is, was based on you know, quite a few engagements that we've seen around the province. And uh, so the impacts that we would seen were came out of discussions that we had with, with really thousands of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians that fed into the budget decision. And as the minister said, and you've heard us, you've heard us all say, is that it was the, uh, it, these were very tough and decisions that we knew that would impact Newfoundlanders and Labradorians and in all regions of the province. And, but we also knew that not taking the decisive actions that needed to be taken, that in the future, that it would be debt servicing and interest payments and so on, that actually will be the things that actually use up the money that would be required to deliver services and engagement with, uh, with people like Eugene and others in, in Shashishi. And I guess his concern is, why not have those con some of those conversations before you've made the decisions mm -hmm. to have the information yeah. rather than just coming out and saying, we've made the decision, here it is. Well, there was lots of opportunity around the province and including in Labrador for people to, you know, feed into the discussion uh, before the decisions were made. These were open, these were open consultations, open discussions that were, were very clearly and, and many, many people showed up. They showed up in, in person at the engagement sessions. They showed up through email, through letters, and you name it. So there was uh, lots of opportunity for people to feed into the budget decisions. And we made it very clear, you know, what those decisions were, were all about. And, and Peter, I think, you know, one of the things that is Im important for us to understand is this particular budget, um, you know, uh, got us in a place where we uh, can continue to borrow. And that was really important. But we have a lot more work to do on the things that are important for the people of the province uh, uh, for us to deliver. And whether those are um, you know, continuing conversations post the budget that lead into uh, decisions for the supplemental budget, uh, things that lead into the March budget next year. Um, those dialogues are really important. But you know, I, I just, as finance minister, one of the responsibilities I have is I actually sign the paper for the debt, for the loans. And since January, I have signed um, what would be the equivalent of if an average, you know, we take a $200,000 mortgage, probably not the average mortgage, but let's just use round numbers. $200,000 mortgage, I've signed on behalf of all of us 
9,500 of them since January. Like the, the debt that we are carrying and the debt we're going to carry, we have to do things to fix that and we have to pull together as a community. And nobody, I think, I don't think the Premier or I or any of us believe that this budget is perfect. None of us are happy with it. But do we believe this is the beginning of the things that we need to do as a province to get our, our province back on financial sound footing? Sadly, yes. Currently, uh, I just want to add you know, one comment to that is it, at the end of 2016, the fiscal year 2016, leading into this, this budget, uh, every Newfoundlander and Labradorian, when you look at the per capita debt uh, nationally, we were at around $23,000. If unchecked in the next seven years, that would be at 53000 And just to put that in context, the next province to us who now are, is in a balanced budget would be Quebec. They're at 22000 So this, this situation and the amount of debt that we were carrying was really, really pushing uh, the economic agenda in our province. And it was very difficult, as the, pre as the minister just said, to actually even go out and establish long-term borrowing. Now, we've been in a position mm -hmm. uh, to be able to do that now, which takes a lot of risk out of play for the province in terms of getting interest rates that are predictable and dependable so that, indeed, we don't get burdened with, the, uh, with interest costs, which will then, any savings we have there can go right back into services for Newfoundlanders and, and Labradorians. Okay, well, let's go to Carolyn, who has another question. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Peter. We're going to switch gears a little bit here. And uh, this question is about mental health funding, and it comes in from Jeff Rose Martland on Twitter. And Jeff wants to know, why is the Ball government not allocating funds to address the mental health care crisis? Yeah. Well, as, uh, as most people would know, we still had the, uh, the uh, all-party committee on mental health. That, that's still funding and still doing its work. So all of this will lead into a provincial mental health strategy. We've also put in uh, some funds in this particular budget to deal with the Waterford issue, which is, which is a commitment that I had made. And in order for us to get r into a modern delivery of mental health, you know, we need to know that we've got a modern facility that's available to us. So we're, the Waterford uh, situation is there's money allocated in this, in this budget to actually help us proceed with that. When but it's just enough money to try and do some planning work. This isn't actually enough money to start which constructing absolutely a new hospital. Which, no, absolutely, and that's where it is because we need to plan to see what the magnitude of the cost is. Then the decision will be made is how we proceed with this, either through, either through the uh, traditional funding mechanism and borrowing to build the, build the Waterford as, as a provincial, uh, provincially owned or to explore the options around performance-based infrastructure, which will then, but getting the services in place is, is important. So we have the all-party committee. Uh, they will do their work, come back with recommendations, mm -hmm. wh which will lead into and feed into the provincial mental health strategy, work around the Waterford that, needs, that would need to be done. So mental health is certainly, that's, it's a priority for us, and we will continue to make the investments in the future, because in order for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians that have to deal with mental health on a daily basis, in order for them, to lead meaningful, productive lives, we need to make sure that mental health services are available to them. And, you know, this is laying the, the, uh, the foundation and the framework for that to happen. Now, if the committee comes back and says, look, we have a, here's a list of five things mm -hmm. we need to do, there's a price tag attached, are you committed to finding the money to make sure they can actually get implemented? Well, the, the, that's what strategies does. You know, strategies will put in place, these are the things that we can do now, these are the things that could be done in, the, uh, in you know, two or three years, however it takes, however long it takes to roll that strategy keep in mind that we this is an example we can work with our federal colleagues as well because they have made mental health a, a priority as well so those relationships have yet to be uh, fully developed at any national level right now but we know it is a priority for us so in order for us to be ready to actually uh, uh, to, to get an understanding of where the federal government would want to be where it fits into provincial strategy we have to do this work right now and we're committed to doing it well, you're watching a very special here and now. It's a live special here on CBC Television and online at cbc.ca slash nl. If you want to join the conversation, there's how you can do it. We're asking questions here to the finance minister and the premier who are guests here in the studio. And let's go to the next question. Well, actually, let's first, there's a look at uh, some of the protesters who are still out front and at CBC. They've got their own message for the government. Uh, they had an opportunity to chat a little bit with the premier and the finance minister on their way into the studio here. 
And let's move on to our next question. This is one that came in from our online chat. Would your government consider selling, say, 25% of Muskrat Falls to the federal government with an option to buy it back? Will your government ask the federal government to give its share of Hibernia back to Newfoundland and Labrador with the option to pay for it later? So I guess it's, it's a bit like a car. Can we get it now, and then can we make the payments on this a little <laughs> bit later? So let's start first with the Muskrat Falls, because this is something both you and Ms. Bennett have complained about the amount of money that we're going to have to funnel into this project. Why not look at selling it, if not to the federal government, to someone else, to have them inject the cash, leaving more cash available for you to do other things. Yeah, so what you're talking about, Peter, is actually having someone come in from the outside to take a, an equity position or a position within Muskrat to actually, uh, you know, get it to the finish line. So first of all, uh, we have, uh, you know, the new CEO is in place right now. He's going to take his time to actually review and take a look at the project, use his 35 years of experience in mega projects and, his, and the experience that he would have in hydro projects. So, you know, we're going to work with him to see, you know, what the opinion is, is there. There's already $6.5 billion worth of work committed to the Muskrat Falls project. And as well as that, uh, we're waiting now till the end of May because we're waiting for rebaselining on the project, which will impact costs and schedule. So, you know, once we have all this information, the options that we have available to us with the informed opinion that we would see with the new CEO and Stan Marshall, all of this will feed into, you know, what our options are going forward on this project. But we still must, uh, we still cannot forget that we have, you know, legal obligations, you know, with, uh, to Nova Scotia. We have, uh, we have 6.5 billion committed to this that as a province we are responsible for. But, you know, we're just not giving up on this. We've got to look and explore what the options are for Muskrat Falls so we can deal with all these, these issues that surround this project, which requires an infusion of nearly $3 billion over the next three years. So if, if Mr. Marshall had a look at the op and came forward with the option to say, you know what, maybe it makes sense to sell. Would you be open to selling part of the project? I think any decision that we made on anything, uh, that we make on anything in the province that, in, that impacts our budget, we, we do that with the best interests of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. So when we have all this information, which will be forthcoming now in the next few weeks, I think it's an important decision, a discussion that we had to have, that we had to have. So we will make it in the best interest of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians when we have the information that's required to be, to be able to make those decisions. I just wanted to add, Peter, you mentioned that um, you know, can we sell the equity so we can have more cash? And I think one of the things that um, it's important uh, to understand, um, and I'm not sure I fully understood it as much until I became finance minister, but the deficit that we have means that for every thousand dollars we spend, we only have, you know, seven hundred and fifty dollars of the thousand we need. Um, borrowing is a different issue from the deficit we have. And we, our province, uh, when you compare us to all other provinces in Canada, we have some of the toughest challenges when it comes to um, the bond rating agencies. Now, I know everybody glazes over when we say that, but when it comes to the cost of borrowing, we have some of the toughest uh, hurdles to overcome uh, when it comes to borrowing. Uh, other provinces, Alberta, it's way up at the top. It's a little easier for them, a lot easier for them to borrow. So the deficit puts us in a situation where our borrowing costs are higher. The money we're borrowing to put into projects like Muskrat Falls or money we're injecting into any um, other entity, agency, board, and commission has to be stewarded in the best interest of the people of the province. And as the Premier has said, um, you know, as we go through the review that Ernst & Young is doing, as we go through uh, the feedback from Mr. Marshall, I'm confident that we are going to see um, from NALCOR and from Mr. Marshall ideas uh, that are going to have to be considered about what are, the, what, what are the steps forward and how do we make sure that we create a financially stable province uh, for all of us so that we can have the services that um, you know, so many people um, need across, uh, across uh, the island in Labrador. In the minister's comments here, there was one thing that uh, kind of jogged my memory there because I get asked this question quite often, is why did Newfoundland and Labrador take the approach that it did when it seemed that Alberta took a very different approach within mm -hmm. their budget? Well, the simple answer to that is, is Alberta did not have any debt at all. Right. And even the track that they are on right now, in the next five years, they will accumulate $60 billion in debt in Alberta. So the, the, two, the two economies were very different and they were in a very different situation. A added to that is Alberta had a much larger population to actually yeah. uh, to be able to make the decisions that they made. But it was simply down, no debt in Alberta, and they will be accumulating nearly $60 billion now in the next five years. 
Let's go to Carolyn for another oh, question. Right. So we received uh, our next question online on our website at cbc.ca slash NL. And this comes in from Anne-Marie Anninson. And Anne-Marie wants to know, is there any chance you will make amendments to this budget before you present it for a vote? So is this budget set in stone or is there a possibility you may reconsider, say, the levy or anything in the budget or is it set in stone? Yeah, so, and again, this is a question that we get asked quite often. What we have, what the minister put in place is, is a budget. Uh, so it's about $8.48 billion and a $1.8 billion deficit. So that is really the budget envelope that we have to work with. And so that is the budget envelope that we will take to the House of Assembly because these are the estimates that we put, uh, that we put to service, that we put to the to the legislature so that we can provide the necessary means in terms of dollars to actually supply the services uh, that people uh, that will people need one of the things uh, so th the budget envelope that we see it right now is the is the envelope that will be put to the vote within the house of assembly why not why not be open to amendments why not say look if there are better ideas if there are changes if there's mistakes that we've made we're open to fixing them tweaking you know mm -hmm. if you're taking money here you got to put it back somewhere else but why not be open to that we are open to it, mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons why when you create a budget, um, then you start to work towards what the next year's budget is. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about, and the Premier has been very clear, we've been very clear on the deficit, uh, temporary deficit levy, you know, we want to work as fast as we can, as hard as we can, to remove that tax. And as things change, you know, when the price of oil, price of oil goes up by a dollar, we pick up $23 million. Um, in uh, royalties. So uh, when things change and as we get new information, part of our responsibility as um, you know, uh, ministers of the Crown is to work with uh, the talented bureaucracy that are there on how we can evolve and change things and manage things on a daily basis. But we also have to hold um, ourselves and um, the bureaucracy accountable for making sure that the decisions we make on a daily basis um, are within a certain envelope. And that's what the budget is, is designed to do. It's designed to say, look, this is, uh, as the Premier said, the spending envelope, um, and that's the plan we put forward, because the machinery of government, we're the biggest spender, um, I would suggest, uh, in, in the province, and the machinery of that is going to take takes a while to move forward. Yeah. We are listening, and we'll continue to listen and, and make the changes that people want as we go forward. But can you understand why people are frustrated when there are yeah. parts of this budget they really don't like? They call up their MHA, mm -hmm. and they feel like there's absolutely nothing I can do to actually affect a change. Well, Peter, I will tell you, there's <laughs> a, a lot of parts of this budget that I don't like as well. Yeah. And this is, but in fact, you know, these are the decisions that were made feeding into, into the budget when we were left with very, very little choice when you look at where we were financially in the province. Number one, we had to secure our ability mm -hmm. to go out and borrow money to keep, you know, keep the services available. The other thing, too, that we haven't discussed tonight is that inside of this budget envelope, there's $570 million in infrastructure. Much of that money can be leveraged with, uh, with uh, communities, can be leveraged with the uh, federal government, and in some cases can be uh, leveraged with the private sector. So it was important to put this level of infra infrastructure spending in place so we can create employment for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. And $570 billion or million, a billion dollars or million dollars is a significant part of infrastructure that will leverage you know, many opportunities for us over the coming year. And, and I just add, um, you know, we work with um, very, um, you know, there's 38 talented people in the House of Assembly uh, in, in, in addition to the Premier and I, and all 38 of those uh, MHAs are doing their very best to represent the interests of their district, and certainly our government caucus is no different. They are advocating on behalf of the people that are there in their, in their constituents, and we will continue to have dialogues with, with those elected representatives, those colleagues of ours, as we move through to the fall and into you know, the next coming years. Um, but make no mistake, they are advocating very, very loudly um, for, their, uh, for their communities. What they all realize, as we do, as I'm sure everybody in the province realizes, that this situation is, uh, is very difficult for everybody. Nobody um, wants uh, a budget like this, um, but it's one that um, you know, had to be done based on the, uh, the, the risks that we had, uh, had assessed. Okay, well, let's move on to the next question. This is one that we got on Twitter, and it comes from Brad Parsons, who wants to know, Mr. Ball, at what moment did you have the what have we done moment 
regarding the huge HST reversal mistake. So it was one of your first things you said, we're going to scrap the <laughs> HST mistake uh, increase. At what point did you go, uh-oh, we're going to have to put this back on? <laughs> Thanks, Brad, <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> that decision around the HST, first when we went into the mid-year update, uh, then at it was at $1.8 uh, billion. Dollars. That was the forecasted deficit. So we did a lot of ref reflection. I certainly did a lot of reflection over Christmas on some of those decisions. As we got into January, it became very clear that the situation was getting much worse. We had oil at one point at $27 <laughs> a barrel. We went around this province and spoke to, like I said, thousands of people. Many people came and said to me, Dwight, you, wanna re you should rethink this decision, this, this statement that you've made. You know, I could have been stubborn and for political reasons have said, you know what, I, because I didn't. I, this is not a decision that I wanted to reverse. But I could have been stubborn and for the political reasons, you know, held my ground on that. But that is not what would have been best for the province. So the decision to made to put the HST discussion back on the table it was done with a considerable amount of reflection. It was done with a, a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion with Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. And uh, quickly, it wasn't about me as Premier, it wasn't about me as Dwight Ball. It was about what's in the best interest of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. And it's really, it's essentially a $200 million uh, you know, revenue stream here that helps us in the situation that we're into right now. Couldn't you have been a little more cautious in December and said, you know what, I don't have all the numbers here in front of me. You talk about evidence-based decision-making, yeah. say, I'm going to hold off and I'm not going well, to make that decision well until I, I ever, got the numbers. am I ever glad you brought that up? Because during the, hold, uh, during the old uh, election time, and you were part of you know, this, and we put out the election mm -hmm. platform. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the, the PC party had theirs out first with the deficit at around 1.1%. Uh, billion dollars. The NDP party had theirs out at 1.1 billion dollars. We actually put ours a little higher mm -hmm. than the other two parties. And not once through that old engagement, th we had lots of people that reviewed those platforms, including economists and many other people within the province. No one came back and said, boy, that number should be much higher. No one came back. So our platform was put in place with the numbers that the previous administration had put in place, keeping in mind that I had reached out. Mm -hmm. I had reached out on September yep. the 28th looking for a fiscal update. I asked Still for information months. during many of the debates and it was not forthcoming. So these, this is why that decision was made. And you know, upon reflection to that, we, we uh, put the platform in place with the information that we had, just like the other two parties did. Okay, well, let's head over to Carolyn, who's got another question here in our audience. Thanks, Peter. Yes, I'm here with Brandon O'Brien. And Brandon, you are just about to graduate from the Marine Institute, right. um, probably wondering what you're going to do next. That's exactly right, Carolyn. So what's your question to the Premier and the Minister? My question is, uh, Premier Ball, in your newly laid out budget, there are more cost increases that affect young people than anyone else. As a young person, you automatically pay more for insurance simply because you're young. Uh, we tend to do more driving around with this new gas increase. We'll be paying even more in tax. And when starting off after post-secondary, there are more numerous and more expensive purchases than in any other time in your life. So I guess my question, Premier Ball, is if you were a young person graduating from post-secondary in a time such as this, and you were graduating into a highly potential field, would you stay in Newfoundland and Labrador? And why? Absolutely, I would stay in Newfoundland and Labrador. And when you look at the future, when you look at the assets that we have available to us to build the, a successful economy, and they're numerous. Mm -hmm. We just saw last, uh, last weekend when Stat Oil came out and said that they were go actually going to do 10 more, uh, 10 more uh, exploration, you know, exploration wells. wells within offshore Newfoundland and Labrador. So that's a good, you know, this is, this is one of the reasons why I'm very optimistic about our future, but I do not want to. Uh, let debt servicing extract some of the wealth that I'm hoping that you, Brandon, can take advantage of in the future. We also, s we also know that in the coming years, we've got quite a few retirements that we'll be leaning on people mm -hmm. like yourself, highly skilled individuals and educated Newfoundlanders and, and Labradorians who actually fill uh, those new jobs in our province. So I'm optimistic about our future. Uh, you know, to be very 
honest with you, there is a lot of good reasons and, and, and good assets that we can rebuild this, uh, this province on, but debt is not one of them. And one of the things that we want to get, manage and get this debt under control is for people just like you. Because during the renewal initiative, there was one thing that people told us loud and clear is do not kick do not kick this debt levels down to the next generation. Don't saddle them with a burden of debt that they will actually carry for this generation. So, you know, there's a, there were a lot of decisions that we had made with people just like you in mind. But what's worse, uh, you know, uh, kicking it down to the next generation or having, to, having no generation left to fill the jobs because well, they've all moved away? Well, as I said earlier there, in, in right now it's at $23,000 for every man, woman, and child. And in the next seven years, that would be $53,000. So that's well within the, uh, the lifespan of everyone in this room, I hope, and for people like you. So uh, what we were trying to do is not to saddle your life with that $53,000 debt, which is now currently at 23000 No other province in this confederation is in the situation that we're into. And we want to make sure that we secure your future and for the future of many other Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Mr. Baller, are you not concerned, though, that your own figures are showing that we're going to lose 20,000 jobs in this province before we get to that 2020 time frame? We've, uh, we've got three mega projects, as you know, within the province right now. So the anticipation and phasing in of those projects or, or phasing out of those projects has been something that's been, widely, under, that's been uh, widely understood for quite some time now. So the job now for us is, number one, is, is wrestle this current debt situation, put in measures and investments into the economy so that we can, uh, the, infra the infrastructure investment of $570 million is, a, is an example of that, then making the investments so we can diversify the economy into the other sectors that we're, so we know where there's a lot of wealth, a lot of stranded wealth that we can actually generate new sources of revenue so people like Brandon can have a yeah. successful future in our province. We, I mean we've had an economy built um, for almost a decade on um, you know around one sector which was um, you know primarily oil and you know for young people um, like Brandon you know you have to be able to find employment in a province that uh, it grows not only uh, in oil, which is a very important part of our economy, but also in areas like technology, fisheries, agriculture, aquaculture, mining, um, you know, that the assets that we can uh, naturally have, but also the assets from the uh, work that people can do so that we can sell those, as I call them sometimes, those widgets globally. Because we can't continue to um, rely on, a, on a, a, a single line of revenue that is so risk, risk, so fraught with risk. We can't control global oil prices. 500,000 of us can't. But what we can control is the variety of ways that we will provide opportunities for young people. And to the tax question, our, you know, our job is to make sure that we do everything we can, as the Premier has already said, to look at ways of eliminating the waste, making sure that we provide public services in an efficient and an effective, sustainable way, and that we look to make our province um, as exciting for you to stay as it was for us when we decided to stay. I would like to add too that even with the, the tax regime that's now put in place is we are still competitive with just about every province in Canada right now with the exception of Alberta and BC. Mm -hmm. So if you look at anywhere in Atlantic Canada right now, we are still very competitive. And when you look at many other regions, uh, so it's, it's, I'm not happy to say that we can't do better. We will do better. But the main thing right now is to make sure that we get this debt under control. We only have a couple of minutes left, so I just wanted to ask you, Minister Bennett, how this budget has affected you on a personal level. Uh, I'm sure you knew that this budget would be very unpopular, uh, but the criticism on social media, protests, you even had a protest at one of the McDonald's restaurants over the weekend. It's all been very personal. Were you surprised that people are so angry with you on a personal level? Um, I think that we all, everybody in the province, is angry about this situation. I'm angry too. Um, and I understand that the people of the province, my neighbors, my friends, people in this audience, people outside, um, need to have a focal point for that anger. Um, and if that's my job um, as finance minister um, to be that uh, person right now, then I'll, I'll, I'll take that on for my province because I believe 
that what we have to do as a community is to pull together to get ourselves out of this. Um, so I won't say this, is, this has been the hardest thing I've done. It is not an easy job for all those people that have said it's tough. Um, but I'm committed to serving the people of the province and I'll continue to do that. I'm and grateful to do it. And I guess one final question. We've got about a minute left. Mr. Ball, we heard a lot of talk about this 500,000 advisors, but we've seen a lot of people who feel like that listening hasn't stopped. It happened during the campaign, but now they're feeling like they're not being listened to. What concrete steps are you going to do to actually address some of these concerns, especially about the levy that you've said isn't going anywhere? In about 30 seconds. The levy is going somewhere. It is going somewhere. But that not is for two years. That's it's not going that's in this No, it'll, it'll be started before then. As you know, it's in, it's in the, the, last, the last threshold, the last 30 or the first 30 percent comes off in, in 2018. Mm -hmm. So it is already planned to be phased out. And I can tell you, if we can do that quicker, we will mm -hmm. do that faster. So it's important that we get uh, the temporary levy as an example. So we have listened to people in Newfoundland and Labrador, and we're going to continue to do that. Matter of fact, this summer we will start that engagement process again. And you know, next year we'll be into a, a budget. And you know, our uh, you know our hope right now is that we can put in the foundation that we can build the next generation for the economy of Newfoundland okay, and Labrador. Okay, Mr. Ball, that's all the time we have for tonight's special. Here and now, your questions, their answers. I want to thank you both for coming in. And can we get a round of applause from our audience for? And thanks also to our audience who uh, joined us here in the studio and everyone at home who sent in your questions and comments. Now, Carolyn, Jonathan and Ryan are going to be back tomorrow with a regular here and now. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. Have a great night. following.